I'm with Glue. Um, super excited to talk with you today. I've got Megan from the Glue team on here with me as well. Um, you don't see my face a lot. I'm usually running our webinars behind the camera, um, but excited to be on screen with you today doing a panel Q&A with a bunch of really talented people, um, some of our, our favorite um, you know, experts from across the e-commerce industry. So we're super excited to, to bring their insights to you today. Um, I'm just going to do a quick introduction um, and we'll give a couple minutes just in case people are a little bit late trickling in. Um, so Meg and I will just kick this off quick, then we'll invite our friends from Big Commerce and Mute 6 up on screen um, and we'll get this started. So super excited. If you guys want to let us know where you're tuning in from, um, what store you're with, um, say hi in the chat. We'd love that. Um, get the chat popping. So yeah, feel free to say hi and we'll go ahead and get started. Excited to have you with us today. I'm going to share my screen in just a second. Um, Meg, if you want to let me know if you can see my screen. Um, awesome. So yeah, so we're here today. We're going to be talking about creating a game plan for growth in the current e-commerce environment and how to close the loop in your strategy from your uh, you know, e-commerce storefront, your website, to your customer acquisition strategies, to the data and analytics that kind of tie all that together. Um, and we're so excited to have a couple of friends with us today. Um, Daniel Ferdig, the global director of partnerships from Big Commerce, and Moody Nashawati, the chief strategy officer at Meet6. I'm going to invite them up in just a second to introduce themselves, but we're so grateful to have them with us today. We're super excited. Um, and their contact information is all on here. So if you guys want to get in touch with them afterwards, um, I'm going to pop a link to these slides in the comments in just a minute so you can follow along and I'll send it out afterwards as well. Um, so we're going to be covering a couple things. It's going to be a live Q&A. Um, so if you guys have questions throughout, feel free to just drop them in the chat and we'll get to them kind of as we go and we'll leave some time at the end for questions as well. Um, we're going to be covering what merchants are doing right now to capitalize on all this changing consumer behavior, what changes merchants are making to their storefronts to make it easier for people to shop online with them, what advertising strategies are winning right now, what data you can trust really to provide the best feedback loop because there's a lot of data and a lot of trends going on, um, and finally just what KPIs you can look at to identify some opportunities for growth right now. Um, and yeah, here's the questions we're going to be running through. Um, I'll, I'll pop a link to these in the chat in just a second. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite our panelists up on screen. One second. All right. Um, Dan, Moody, you guys want to give a quick introduction? Please, you first. Sure. Uh, so yeah, I'm Chief Strategy at Mute6. Uh, we are a perform omnichannel performance media agency. Uh, we satisfy e-commerce clients, about 250. Uh, and we run about $400 million in terms of ad spend across Facebook, Google, TikTok, and a bunch of other channels. And I happen to run all of uh, strategy and making sure we uh, drive success and ROI and all that spent. Um, and Dan Furtick, Abby, Megan, thank you for having me here today. Excited to join. Um, I look after global agency partnerships for big commerce. For those that might not be familiar, we are a software as a service e-commerce platform uh, serving about 60,000 customers globally. And uh, I work with great agencies like Mute6 to help design acquisition strategies, conversion strategies, and really slick user experiences across our software. Awesome, thank you guys both for joining us. We're so excited to have you. Wonderful. Happy to be here. So just to kick things off, I'm, I'm interested to get kind of just a quick temperature check from, from you guys. We've seen, you know, a lot has happened in the news in the past, you know, three to four months. We've heard a lot about like e-commerce is booming right now, but there are certain industries that are definitely still struggling. Like, how are the merchants you guys work with feeling right now? What are you hearing and seeing from the brands that you work with every day? Yeah, and I can and I can I can maybe jump in quickly. And I know you know Moody and his team do a great work of sharing data on you know particular industries um, that are showing strength and others that are showing weakness. Definitely would love to hear from him on that. I mean, from the platform perspective. Um, the honest answer is that the, the mood kind of changes week to week, right? And um, 
you know, one week it's, it's cautious optimism. The next week is just purely caution, um, opportunism, opportunism. I think on a macro level though, you know, what we're seeing, not just in our, in our technology, but in across e-commerce is I think really historic in terms of when you think of consumer shopping behavior, right? To give you some context, um, e-commerce as a percentage of, of spend um, 10 years ago was just under 5%, right? And it took a decade to 2020 to get to 15%. Now, most economists at this point think just through the first five months of 2020, that number has already doubled to about 30%. And most do believe that this is the type of catalyst that can lead to a more permanent change in, in terms of how consumers behave how they shop, um, and that's just happened in four months, what took 10 years prior to do. Um, we're seeing that in our platform, I think gross merchandise sales through our platform is up 80%, so it's happening both on the branded side as well as in marketplaces, um, but our historical average year over year growth has been about 29% across merchants on, our, on the big commerce platform. That number is up closer to 80% since the start of the year. Um, not everybody worth mentioning is benefiting equally, right? And I'll, I'll let Mooney share a little bit about where they're seeing pockets of strength and where we're seeing pockets of weakness. And it's definitely worth the conversation. Um, but it is probably worth mentioning that not every single industry is benefiting equally. Yeah, that's that's exactly it, right? So in a couple of things, I, I got to echo that. I think it's what we've seen in e-commerce in the just sort of penetration of full retail sales uh it's like you said about i think 15 percent in now and you know i think uh what we're looking at in terms of numbers four uh, percent happened in you know just the beginning of this year uh which is crazy in terms of shift um you know because that's it's just such a big number uh but in terms of pockets of what's working for us you know i mean what we do is we just look at you know collectively across our group uh, what, um, you know, what categories are doing well, I mean, off the, in it, it's changed, right? So if, in the beginning it was essentials, it was food and Bev, uh, it was things like home gyms, uh, you know, cookware, uh, home goods too, uh, we're all doing really, really well. Uh, and then now that the economy's opened up, uh, back, you know, and stores are, you know, you're able to go into stores again, we've seen that decline a little bit, but still, the amount of sheer volume uh, in every category has increased. Uh, and what was was actually challenging more on the apparel side, um, you know, things like, uh, you know, things that you would, I think that there's been a massive shift in what sort of clothing or apparel you're buying for the current lifestyle you're in. Um, and we think that's the big opportunity is, you know, the, the brands that have done really well throughout this either we're in a category that happened to be benefited from everything um, or are quickly positioning to new heroes and new products uh, as quickly as they can based off of new consumer needs. Um, and, you know, the one thing, too, that uh, is driving all this change, I think, is, you know, is, is obviously we all, we all have new habits, uh, but they're turning into behaviors. And, and there's a lot of survey data coming out now saying that these things are going to stick. Uh, and for us, we can't see a Q4 uh, where people are actually comfortable going out into stores or into malls uh, and shopping on their own and putting themselves in that risk environment. So we expect a blowout Q4 on the e-commerce side uh, for, for our brands and then for e-commerce as a whole, especially if you know things continue and we keep seeing these spikes uh, and we have to, you know, I, I don't think, uh, I think everyone's against any sort of you know, shut down or locked down or quarantine as strict as it was in the beginning. Uh, but if we get a second wave where this continues, uh, then you're looking at, you know, potential more or the keep keeping of the same in terms of e-commerce sales uh, across the board. Yeah, absolutely. Those are some really good insights and, and data points. I and mean, we've seen a lot of the same thing on our end, um, just, I mean, changes by the month. It, it's so widely different depending on the industry, but just the, the industry-wide numbers that we have been seeing and that we've all been seeing in the news and stuff, I mean, it's just unprecedented levels of change for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested, you know, you mentioned, you know, buying behaviors are changing, but those are turning into habits kind of as time goes on. Um, 
and there's been a lot of talk about how much potential this moment has for e-commerce. Um, so what, what are smart merchants doing right now to kind of capitalize on those changing behaviors, whether that's shifting their business model, shifting their strategies? Um, how are they preparing for the future? And this kind of like new new normal, and I know everyone's been using that term way more than they should. Yeah. Yeah, yeah go ahead, please. Um, now I can talk really quickly in terms of you know the category shift has the category spend has definitely shifted. The obvious ones are things like at home fitness equipment. You know, I didn't realize six months ago. I have two young children. How desperately I needed a background playground, right? So kids and baby, um, we're seeing a shift a lot towards books. People are, um, you know, moving away from like things like digital audio books. And it's also shifting how people think about spend um, towards more physical items as you know, you don't you know you no longer have a commute to listen to an audiobook. You're actually sitting at home and reading it um, instead. Um, you know, but smart merchants are also, you know, not just capitalizing on the you know, breadth of products that they may want to consider offering and the product mix that they want to consider merchandising but also capitalizing on this newfound shift towards online spend, thinking about their acquisition strategy. Um, they're thinking about how they go from a one-time customer purchase, understanding about where that customer came from, how they found them, and then capitalizing on that channel. Um, and then at the point of transaction, really incentivizing consumers to, um, whether that's signing up for the loyalty program, whether that's submitting an email address, um, for future transactions. I think marketers and merchants are becoming more sophisticated about the, the need to be able to um, capitalize on this opportunity and figure out a way to understand who that consumer is, where they're coming from, and what are complementary products or what are ways that they might incentivize them to get to transaction two, which as you know is you know, the almighty sign that you're gonna have a long-term long customer. Yeah, absolutely. You need anything you need to add, add on to that? I don't wanna jump too soon to the next question. Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's interesting. I think there's like a lot of interesting behavioral changes. You know, I mean, home gyms, like I just, I was going to the gym in our office and now I have a Peloton. So that's, you know, and I actually really love it. I'm like, you know what? I'm probably not gonna go back to the gym in the office. Um, I also do like that you don't have to commute anymore. That's, you know, I think I'm saving two hours a day at this point, um, by one having a home gym, but also, so it's like, there's all these actually great things of, you know, that there's good things that have happened. And, you know, I think again, consumer behavior has really changed, uh, in every single industry in every category, you know, people are buying differently and, and, um, they're spending time differently and, you know, physical goods, like you said, um, have experienced an uptick, uh, arts and crafts has experienced an uptick, things like sewing, um, you know, things that get some, you know, kind of like, uh, just new ways to spend your time where you can't potentially spend, uh, on leisure or travel or, um, you know, have also all ticked up. Um, but then interesting things like, um, you know, I think, uh, Meg was going to bring up uh, Alta, right? So like Alta has, you know, and, and how do you buy cosmetics if you're not able to go into like an Alta uh, and actually try things on? So, you know, there's like this big push, I think, from the from the cosmetics industry to come out with things like AR uh, and things that allow you to do more of a virtual try on uh, to, you know, kind of solve some of the friction points of using cosmetics uh, or buying cosmetics. Uh, so, you know, there's there's all this new opportunity because the landscape has really shifted. Uh, and then the people who are, you know, you know, the smart merchants are like, OK, we accept that this is new. Uh, we need to go back in, research, really engage with both our customer base and then uh, our market and learn what they're doing differently so we can approach them with new products uh, and really innovate uh, is is been the ticket and the key that uh, has allowed mar uh, merchants to really succeed here. Yeah, totally. Meg, I think she, I think she said she might have fixed her issue. Do you want to do you want to weigh in there? Yeah, should we try? 
Yay. Yay. <laughs> it's really funny when you can't speak and you're like, <laughs> um, oh, yeah, no, I think those are all great points. I was just going to say, I think it's been, um, I think opportunity is like the main key thing for a lot of our clients and that I've been working with one-on-one -on -one and is also like the adaptability too. Right. So for a lot of my clients, maybe their focus was, um, like we work with the Atri and they were more focused on selling through Nordstrom's and Macy's. Whereas now it's like, Hey, our focus is, you know, we're going full throttle into e-commerce. So I think the merchants that I've seen have been the most successful have been able to readjust their strategy, whether that's, you know, kind of like daily, weekly, um, whatever it has been for this whole thing. But I think the thing is, is there is a lot of opportunity to engage um, direct to that consumer. And so I think that, the brands that I've seen that have done that very well um, have really maximized that opportunity. Just even like Tushy, um, that's a glue client and they they sell toilet paper and bidets and things like that. So, you know, they could never have predicted this insane amount of growth that they saw, but they were like, hey, now that we have this and we have all these customers, we really need to maximize this momentum, um, engage with them and, you know, really just go full force straight ahead. So. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. That's something we've, we've talked a lot about internally. Like we see a lot of clients who have had a big spike. They may be totally different customers than you're used to getting. So, it, you know, the importance of really analyzing this new customer base that you've gotten because of this change in behavior and figure out, you know, how are they alike or different from your typical customers? What can you do to turn them from a one-time kind of, you know, spur of the moment purchase or into a lifetime customer? Whether that's something like, I'm trying to think of like all the things I've bought randomly from like, you know, yard work equipment to like hobby stuff for the house. Like, I, I think there is a lot of opportunities there for brands to turn kind of like, you know, one-time purchasers that, you know, bought something because they were bored in March into into a true, you know, repeat customer. Yeah. And that's something I was actually talking to um, one of my clients about earlier was just this opportunity to connect with your clients, too. I think people are all looking for new ways to connect with people. And so it's a great time to when you get these new customers, educate them about your brand. Like even um, I was talking to somebody, they make cookware earlier. And I was like, you know, they get this from a specific family in Italy. Like, you know, people like to hear that stuff and they really like to connect with you and they like to support, you know, brands that they think are doing great things. And so it's a great time to kind of share your story and, and connect with your customers on a different level than maybe you have in the past. Yeah, totally. Um, on a similar note, so people's behavior is changing a ton. You know, that, that means that the shopping experience has to change to meet that. Uh, we don't see this side of things as much on, on the glue end, you know, we're doing, you know, reporting and analytics and stuff, but how how are you guys seeing, you know, merchants and brands actually changing their shopping experience to make it easier for people to shop with them, whether that's online, curbside pickup, like what, what are people doing right now to kind of meet that need? Hey, Megan, why don't you jump in since you were, you were muted for a while? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I would say a couple of different ways. I think it's, um, and I also tell all my clients this too, is like anything that you invest, like e-commerce is kind of like the future. So anything that you invest in your website or your experience online is not ever going to be a bad thing, right? So um, I think one thing I've noticed too is a lot of people have been on more mobile. So I think it's like one thing is like making sure um, to communicate with your customers. So having an experience where you can easily, you know, get onto the website, order something, communicate, you know, whether that's a chat box that you didn't used to have or, you know, a live chat, whatever that is. But um, I think that's something like your actual experience on the website. I don't know about you guys, but if I'm buying something and it's really difficult, like as impatient as we are these days, um, just, you know, investing in that web optimization, whether that's like across all your different channels too. So mobile, tablet, um, desktop, all of that. So um, I think that's one that's been key. Yeah, I, I would even echo that. Um, we're seeing an, a massive increase in mobile conversion and, and the actual transactions happening on mobile. So there are 
some really foundational things you need to be thinking about as you know blocking and tackling e-commerce plumbing that you need to be thinking about um, for your mobile experience, right? Are the image are the images sized properly for the mobile experience, or do they cause you know an impairment to page load speeds? Um, and that, by the way, will impact your SEO scores, right? So, are you thinking about digital wallets the right way, and are you enabling people to check out if I'm shopping upstairs in my bedroom at 10 p.m. Um, uh, are, do I have to go downstairs and get my wallet um, to be able to make this transaction? Because I'm definitely not going to do that, right? So there's the blocking and tackling that needs to happen. Um, but there's also, I'll, I'll let Moody talk a lot. You know, obviously he's, he's really an expert on top of funnel and early funnel and acquisition. I'll probably focus a little bit more on the mid funnel and conversion. Like there are, this is actually a perfect opportunity for many of our merchants to be rethinking how they focus on mid funnel, right? So um, I won't get political, but you know, transparency is at a premium right now. So are you being transparent if you're having shipping constraints, logistic constraints, warehousing constraints right now, because workers, you're half staffed at in your in your warehouse, you know, are there gonna be constraints about shipping? Be super transparent about that. Um, in your search functionality and in your category navigation, increasingly we're seeing merchants actually list like in stock as a category that you can shop. Especially, we just had a client launch in the in the, a well-known client in the cycling industry. As somebody who spent nearly three weeks trying to find a bike that was available that I wanted, it's really hard to find bicycles right now. And like they'd launched a new e-commerce experience in a time when like there's not a lot of inventory because everyone apparently is buying bicycles, right? Um, you need to be flexible about, you know, um, buy online pickup in store, curbside pickup. If you're not offering that yet, you have to be doing that. Um, it's a good time to be rethinking your return policies, mm -hmm. right? Because if people can't come into your store to return products, if, you know, if I'm used to go, if I'm a, a very tactile person, and I need to touch things to buy them. But I'm taking the leap because I can't walk into your store and I buy it online. I might have a higher return rate, so you might want to rethink your return rates, and, and you might want to rethink what those policies look like. It's a good time to be surprising and delighting customers in, in an era where we're, it seems like we're handed bad news every single week. Um, you know, if you can surprise and delight your customers with a gift with purchase or something to that effect, we're seeing that have a really dramatic impact on social uh, media posts and, and, and brand ambassadorship. Um, and then things like in-stock notifications, remind me when this is back in stock, things of that nature are super important if you are low on inventory, that you're smart about setting those reminders for consumers. If it was something they were in, in market for and you don't have it available to make sure that they're, one, you're getting their email address, but two, you know, you can potentially be top of mind when the product does become available. Yeah. Um, those were all really well said. Uh, uh, I, I'd, I'd, I'd also echo that uh, transparency is key uh, on, you know, I, mean, I think uh, touch points along the customer journey, but also in terms of where you stand on, you know, there's certain, you know, social changes that are happening right now that are really important and they, in your own uh, sort of brand message around everything uh, is, is really important. And, you know, I think consumers more than ever are making decisions, not just based off of products and their needs, uh, but also, you know, where brands stand um, for certain, you know, social changes. So uh, something to consider is, is having your message, having a message, but also having it be transparent, potentially uh, easy to find or front and center, uh, depending on who your audience is. Uh, and how much you as a brand would like to take a stand. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a good point. Um, yeah, all, all really good points. And I, I couldn't agree more on the transparency side of things. I think I've, I've been doing a ton of online shopping, obviously like everyone else right now. And the brands that I have been happiest to spend my money with and to shop with are the ones who have been, you know, so overly communicative and transparent about like, What's the status of like, how are they handling the COVID stuff? Are there gonna be shipping delays? What What's their new policy? They have alert banners everywhere in the top of their website. Like if you don't have that right now, that would definitely be a, a, a red flag because I'm assuming your operations have changed to some degree right now. So you should be telling your customers about that. Yeah. Um, 
Moving into more of the you know acquisition and the top of funnel stuff, there have been some really interesting you know ad campaigns and trends you know going around right now. What strategies are are winning for brands right now? Kind of you know specific examples or just kind of like top line strategies that you have seen success with? Yeah, I'd love to get into this a little bit. But so at, at top of funnel. You know, again, so consumers have new needs and, you know, brands are developing new products to fit those needs. Um, they also have, you know, new lifestyle. So like creative that uh, reflects what people are doing, you know, today, you know, versus what they were doing pre-COVID uh, is, is important to have. Like, for instance, for a while, uh, like a company like Theragun works with us. Uh, all of their creative is now like work from home creative or, you know, at home type recovery using their devices versus it might have been at the gym previously or with a professional. Um, so, you know, just kind of messaging the moment, messaging, uh, you know, people's current lifestyles is really important in terms of type of content to make. Uh, and then in terms of like emerging channels, TikTok for us uh, is something we're, we're playing with. Uh, they have had a lot of rapid changes to their algorithm and the the way you buy media there. And they're trying to emulate Facebook as much as possible in terms of uh, capabilities from an ad buying standpoint, um, which lo all look really, really promising, but they're just not there yet. But from a, so from a organic content standpoint, the best video creators right now all live on TikTok because they get rewarded for content and, and, uh, they can basically explode overnight if they know how to make great content. Uh, so if you want to engage the best content creators uh, for your brand, go find them on TikTok. It's actually really easy. Uh, we've got an influencer program that's just doing this. Also, if they make really good content, that stuff goes viral. It kind of reminds me of working with influencers in 2014, 15, before it got completely saturated. Uh, it's a great time and this happens three or four times a week where it's like, where did we get that spike in revenue for X brand? And it's like, oh, you can match it up to a TikTok video that happened to go viral again. So, you know, it's interesting time there. Um, also COVID, you know, because of COVID, people are spending way more time on, or it just kind of fast forward to the amount of downloads on TikTok was one of the top downloaded apps. Um, and, uh, you know, they just think there's also 80 million users in the US uh, active monthly on uh, TikTok. And the last thing I'd say about that is uh, about 40% are actually over the age of 25. So it's no longer kind of a, a young demographic as most people thought for a while. Um, you're seeing the, the largest growing demographic are actually millennials, uh, Gen Xers and, and, and boomers uh, versus, uh, you know, they've already kind of capped out on uh, the younger demographic. So uh, TikTok's big, uh, so it's been basically call me like it was basically a billboard for TikTok at that point. Um, but that's for us has been really exciting. Uh, and then you know the Facebook and the rest of the channels are still great um, in there, but they're changing every day. And if you, if we want, we can kind of talk about what's happening in July. Um, and, and but I, I first let's give a chance to the rest of the panel to kind of give a. Some insight here on what they think. Yeah, Moody, we could we should definitely come back to you on this. I mean, this is your domain, right? But um, I, I would have don't have too much to add to that other than, you know, there's a lot of noise right now, including from a big commerce customer, Ben and Jerry's, about you know Facebook. I mean, anyone who has any commerce news that concerns around uh, censorship and concerns around lack of censorship is something that is, I think, on brands' minds, and they're kind of waiting and seeing how big a tidal wave that becomes. North Face and, and Ben and Jerry's obviously have taken a stand and, and been pretty vocal. Um, we're definitely seeing an increase in, in our customers wanting to explore YouTube as a channel. We're seeing YouTube interest increase considerably. Um, and then other, TikTok is certainly one of them, but Pinterest as well. Um, is there an avenue to be able to grow revenue through um, mediums like Pinterest as well? Um, but certainly, yeah, certainly keen to hear more about in terms of the, the actual June data would be interesting to me. Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to add, so um, I think one thing I've seen that's been successful too is like obviously utilizing all the different channels. And Moody, do you have a TikTok? Oh, I have a TikTok. 
Okay, I'm gonna call you. I gotta see some of these. Um, but I was just gonna say too, regardless of the channel, I think a big thing too um, is just the relevant messaging. So I've really like I shop a lot online too, and I always have just because that's um, mostly who I work with. But um, like Tucker Nuck is one of our clients, and I think that one of the things that they've done is they do like all of their email messaging is like really relevant where it's like and it's just not necessarily about what they're selling but they have like recipes so like this weekend i got one that was like hey here's a checklist of things to do uh learn to tie-dye make your own homemade guacamole compete in a bocce ball contest make a donation um for a meal so i think that's kind of cool because it ties into the brand but it also gives like consumers like you know then they are interested in their blog and things like that. So I think that's also um, a good way is like kind of using your message creatively to engage with your clients. And then um, another one I've seen is uh, third three bird nest. So they actually put tops on the top of the website because I know about you guys and the people on the panel, but with everybody being on the Zoom calls, everybody's just mainly focused on what they're wearing up here. So making like tops very yeah. accessible. Please don't um, make me stand up. Yeah. <laughs> I won't. But um, so I think those are kind of like getting creative with the messaging and stuff like that that's relevant, um, you know, goes a long way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Moody would love to hear more if you have more thoughts there. I feel like, you know, everybody on this call could probably listen to you talk about ad strategy for, for days. So would love any additional insights you have. Yeah, so oh, just to keep going on the TikTok thing, taking the, so if you're, uh, if you actually work, so like what we're doing is we'll go, we'll find influencers, we'll send them products. Um, and it's so nice because it's, it's like such more, it's, it's so much more of a positive community just because it's so new and the creators there are just getting started and you know, they don't have agents yet and they're not like, and it's not like Instagram where, you know, it's just like something that's already like people have a structure of how they work together. Right. So it's all kind of, uh, there's a lot of curiosity. There's a lot of ex exploratory relationships. Um, but you can send creators a lot of free product uh, and they'll go and they'll just make content. And, and it, if it has USPs in it, if it educates uh, and does a little bit of selling, uh, it'll end up probably doing really well. Uh, and then you can take that content and put it on Facebook or Instagram, put media behind it, and it'll become, uh, chances are it'll become some of your best ads on Facebook. Um, you know, we've been big advocates on UGC uh, since, you know, years ago when we first started running like a lot of user generated content, but now it's like the video content coming out of TikTok and then put it on other channels, uh, is something that's really working well, uh, as well. Um, but yeah, um, you know, speaking of just like what's happening, you know, politically in July with the blackout with, uh, with, uh, just the boycott of, uh, our REI is now added to that. There's a lot of brands that are just kind of turning ads off and, it's so it's interesting because like as an ad agency it's like okay what's our stance like what do we think and it's like really like it's it's up to the brands to kind of figure out where they want to how they want to align themselves with the boycott i see here's what my thing is like knowing just all of the sides uh if cpms happen to drop it could be potentially because there's a lot of bigger brands who are in the spotlight who are being you know just kind of uh have to have some sort of stance here uh they're if they if they happen to pull their advertising budgets i know cpms will drop uh which makes it more advantageous for some of the smaller little guys but a lot of the smaller guys can't afford to really take a month off from revenue i think um that's the kind of the scarier part is that if if the if the smaller guys actually pull the plug uh they may not necessarily be alive there um and then secondly it's like who's your audience right like is does your is your audience a uh, audience who's really going to um, be uh, impacted by your stance uh, in in this and your cho your choice to participate or not or are they you know are they you know depending on how big the, the part of your audience that actually cares for this stuff and you don't necessarily have to participate um, so I'm you know I'm I personally I, I think like it. I think it could be for the smaller brands a chance for them to kind of have a 
reduce CPM and maybe take advantage of the big, the big guys who have to kind of shut down for the whole thing, which might be unpopular opinion. Um, that's how, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, no, that's a, an interesting take on it for sure. And a, a good thing for, for brands to keep in mind. I think, um, the, the, the TikTok stuff and the user generated content. I mean, I've seen so many brands who previously, I don't think had really utilized user generated content a ton using it for not only just ads, but like creative on their websites, you know, during the shutdown and during lockdown, they couldn't go out and do, you know, photo shoots for their spring lines. I saw a couple of brands I, I follow on Instagram using in, influencers. I follow on Instagram, you know, using those influencer photo shoots as their actual like ad creative and website creative like, for their like product shoot, which I thought was super interesting. I'm, I'm curious if that is something that will continue. And I kind of would imagine it, it would depending on how it has been performing. Yeah. So that's another big thing is that, you know, it's, you can just access creators uh, a lot more efficiently, which is, you know, versus like going out and shooting this giant production and hiring a bunch of people and, you know, really putting a lot of money into a big shoot. And then hopefully, you know, from a paid media standpoint, it actually pans out as, as something that, you know, uh, generates an ROI and has like a, a CPA within, uh, within range. But, uh, you know, it's now easier than ever, especially again, because of TikTok, but, uh, you know, you can send products to creators and that stuff is awesome because it's so organic uh, in nature to what the feed looks like already. Um, and, you know, and if you talk about how people's shopping behavior are changing, um, you know, they're getting their influence through Instagram, TikTok, um, and online publications now more than ever, uh, especially because they can't go out and they can't, you know, really experience, um, you know, the same sort of, uh, you know, in, in store shopping experience. So it's, it's basically all online now and it's the peers that in friendships that they've made in their online communities in terms of where they're getting, uh, their, their insight and inspiration for how they shop for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And you can just get like really, you know, high quality content from online content creators, Instagram, photographers, TikTok, video producers, like it's high quality content. I would imagine that, that brands will continue to, to rely on that even after, you know, all this is over. Yeah. And the, there's so many photographers and videographers who are putting out like behind the scenes of, of how they shoot the content, which I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a lot of fun too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. hundred yeah. percent. Um, awesome. So we talked a little bit about acquisition, you know, the flip side of that, that brands are always focusing on is retention, retaining their existing customers. So how has that balance been working out lately for the brands you guys have been working with? Like how, how have you been recommending brands focus on acquisition versus retention and, and weighing that balance throughout, throughout COVID, throughout the past couple months? I, I can touch on some of the kind of, um, loyalty aspects of it. I think it, you know, it has shifted considerably. I think from a merchandising standpoint, and this is extending to paid ads, um, but how they merchandise their site is very, uh, is increasingly, at first it wasn't, and they've all become more sophisticated in tune with how consumers are behaving, right? So now you're seeing the work from home bundle. If it's a consumer electronics company, you're seeing the work from home pa package if it's an apparel company. Um, it's no longer about cosmetics for going out. It's about beauty regimens for, you know, staying at home when you, when you can't go get a facial. Um, so we're definitely seeing um, brands get smarter from a, a product mix, a merchandising mix, and a bundling mix to, you know, increase basket sizes and get you trying um, more than one product from, from the, the brand. Um, on the loyalty side, we're, di we're seeing a lift in, in, in implementation of loyalty programs, especially as a means to capitalize on this new stream of customer acquisition. Um, in some ways, and, and Moody alluded to it, um, you know, COVID combined with, you know, what occurred on May 25th and how that's changed the world and, and I think mindfulness of social justice um, a brand more than ever has an opportunity to express what it stands for, right? Um, and brands you might not necessarily have historically thought of as standing for anything, right? So I, I always joke, um, my wife is the least socially inclined person I know, um, maybe one post to social media a year. Um, and 
like Geico, we're Geico customers on the insurance side. They sent us when COVID hit a letter saying, hey, we're waiving um, for the next four months. You won't lose coverage for non-payment for all customers, right? And that compelled my wife who never posts to social media to post to social media a copy of that email that was sent to her. And like talk about becoming like a brand ambassador for insurance company, which is the weirdest thing in the world. Um, but like this, like just being genuine and being caring and being human, um, I think now more than ever is as much a way to engender loyalty and ambassadorship as, you know, actually implementing a structured points-based, spend-based loyalty program. Um, and so I think brands are really starting to wake up to that. And Moody alluded to it, being mindful of, you know, when push comes to, sh to shove, are we there for our customers when they need us most? Are we going to have an opinion, you know, when we see injustice? And, you know, that may or may not include, you know, where, where and how and how much you spend with certain platforms. It may, you know, be as simple as a social media post, but then what are you doing behind that? Um, but I do think we're seeing brands start to realize that that they can actually be more than just another email in the inbox trying to sell me more product. Um, and then def we're definitely seeing that across many of our customers today, for sure. Yeah, those are all, all super good points, I think. You guys have anything to add on that? Nothing on my end. Um, no, I was just going to say one thing, basically both are important right now, but um, one of, like, kind of just like with, the increased traffic, just like with Black Friday, Cyber Monday, it's not, you want like your loyal customers to repeat purchase. You still want to acquire new customers. But one thing um, that somebody was talking about was talking about like their Ollie gummies are out of stock on the website. So it's like, you want to be kind of focused on if you're trying to acquire new customers, it's probably not the best time to be marketing if you're out of stock or if you are out of stock thinking about making it to where then like they could like you said earlier dan you know alert me when it's back but kind of maybe taking care of your customers and giving them first priority to those products so um yeah. i think that's something yeah we have a we have a customer i'll give them a shout out actually I, I take that back i am a customer they are not a big commerce customer but i'll give them a shout out anyway um there's this company called Drinkwell that um when when COVID hit and, and me and everyone, everyone I know was probably having wine on a few community evenings a week, um, hit, they actually proactively, it's a supplement, it's a vitamin you could take if you've had a little bit too much to drink, you'll feel better, better the next morning and it works. Um, they, proactively, they proactively, yeah, we're gonna have everyone leaving the uh, conference. <laughs> They proactively actually sent me, I hadn't even ordered it. They sent me like a, a free like package and there were like, times are tough. Hope, hopefully you don't need this. Wow. If you do, it's here for you. Thanks for being a loyal customer. That's and um, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a customer for life for them now. Mm -hmm. So um, it really is a, a opportunity um, to have a, a relationship with your customer. There was a handwritten note from their founder. Wow. Um, so, you know, you don't need to be a Geico to extend yourself and, and actually think about what is the relationship I can have with my customers today. That's mm -hmm. really cool. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's such a good example of, of how, you know, one gesture can make you a loyal customer of someone forever. Yeah. There are very, very interesting points. That, I mean, there's like a lot of points to that. It's like, you, you have the opportunity to really reach out and make all these really interesting stories. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's not, you know, there are, there are a lot of things happening. So it's like, you can, you can, you know, if you can bring comfort, if you can bring joy, if you can help people pass the time, if you can help people forget and get away from it all for a bit. And it's not necessarily always with products. Sometimes it's like, oh, we made this, you know, Excel sheet of all these really cool things you could be doing uh, that align with who we are as a brand. Or here's a, we put together like Spotify playlists that uh, represent, you know, us as a brand, like take a listen, it's fun. So like, um, you know, I think brands, if they, if they can do it and it fits their persona to be fun and exciting and engage in some way, there's a, there's a 
golden opportunity for it. Um, that being said, there's also this massive opportunity on the acquisition side to go and find new customers. Uh, and so, it, you know, you focus on both hand in hand uh, and uh, you, you do what you can to really kind of balance and round it out. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think that's such a good point. We, uh, Meg and I were talking recently, totally unrelated about, I, I, it might've been a yoga brand or something like it was a women's wellness brand. They sent out this great email newsletter that all it had in it was a, a Spotify playlist. Like it wasn't even a marketing email. And it was just like, Hey, here's this cool thing. It gives you kind of a look into their team. It makes you feel connected to the brand. I think that's such a good point. Um, I think it gets to the very, the most basic level of thinking about like, what is the value that your product is adding to someone's life? And, and how do you make them see that? Whether it's sending them a freebie in the mail or like, you know, yeah, surprise and delight. I, I think, you know, it's the most basic level of like, what are you in this business for? And how is it helping people? And how is it adding to their lives? And how can you highlight that in a, in a really cool way? Yeah, I think one of our, so we have a company called uh, Fun Boy, which makes a pool floaties. Oh, yeah. They also make uh, the kiddie pools and, yeah. it, which is really, so I don't know if you know this, but like sidebar, if you go to Google trends right now and type in kiddie pools, it's like all time high on trends, which is pretty cool. Um, but one of the ads they're running was like just a picture of kids like out in the front yard on, in the kiddie pool. And it was like, um, you know, if you, if you like, you throw them in this and keep them wound all day, they'll sleep more like at night or something. I forget, yeah. the but it was like hilarious. And I was like, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, so you can really take that into your copy and content and creative too. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I have seen from like, you know, the mom influencers on Instagram that kiddie pools are really blowing up right now. Yeah, kiddie pool and fireworks apparently. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> what a weird summer. <laughs> weird time. Cool. All right, we're gonna pivot into our last couple questions now. Kind of, kind of more focused on the data and analytics front. So we got two, two more questions. Do you guys have any thoughts, any questions um, right now? Drop them in the chat box or in the ask the questions module at the bottom. So I'll start reading those. We'll start tackling them kind of towards the end. But um, kind of overarching data and reporting question. We've we've talked a lot, even just on this call, about all the different data trends that are happening. You know, you're consumer behavior is changing, you're getting new customers, your acquisition might be spiking. How do you know what data to focus on right now? Because things are changing so fast. How can you pull out what is data that is actionable that you should really build a strategy around versus what is kind of like a flash in the pan that you, you know, it might go back to normal in a couple months and it's not worth really focusing on. Yeah, um, I can tackle that one. So I think uh, lifetime value is a great thing to look at because that's going to take into account like all the different factors. But it's also something that you can kind of um, focus on in terms of like driving your, you know, force of loyalty with that. Um, so at Glue, we actually, we have these four cornerstone approach that we do with lifetime value. And it kind of looks at like the who, what, where, when um, those are like all based off of, you know, different things in glue. So it's like your customer segmentation is like the action item for the who. So like really analyzing your customers. And I would, I would be doing this, like, you know, I think I've been reading like the companies that are most like assessing, you know, and moving and, and being really fluid. Um, I think that they're going to be the most successful with that. So like identifying like who are your customers, like even just like your VIP and, and ways you can engage with them you know, like Dan or Moody mentioned things that you can do that are very small that really make them feel important. Um, so yeah, the, the who, what, where, and when I think are all great ways. Um, but I think there's, there's going to be some things like obviously, um, you know, with the more traffic and, and things like that, you're going to have some like quick wins that might not necessarily be long-term strategy, but um, I think capitalizing on that and then, you know, looking at your strategy long term too is probably going to change. But um, I also one thing that a lot of my clients have talked about is forecasting is something that's been really important and a much bigger need and focus just because, um, you know, like really for, forecasting like sales, inventory, things like that. It's not necessarily like a hey, fourth of July is coming up. You know, it's not necessarily going to be exactly what it was last year. So kind of like um, you know, really focusing on forecasting the business is a little bit more 
important and different because it's not going to be exactly the same as it has been in the past. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, one thing like a, from a structural standpoint that we're seeing a rise of that I, I don't see going away no matter what happens will be really implementation or at least consideration of some type of subscription program. Um, increasingly, even merchants for whom you might not have even thought of them as someone for whom a subscription makes sense, they're thinking about how that model might work for them as well. Um, and it's now a consideration for almost every, every merchant out there. Doesn't mean it's a fit for everybody, but they're all thinking about it and how it might be implemented for their business as well. Yeah, and then so I can add to that too on the data side. Uh, look, getting to know your deep analytics uh, with like LTV and you know just kind of understanding uh, incrementality across you know your your paid media channels uh, are all really important and things you should definitely be focusing on and just just so you understand what those numbers look like. Um, but the other thing too that. I think is like one of the biggest things you could do is just go out and talk with your customers, your VIPs, your best customers, see who they are, really start to understand what their needs are, who like what why are they, you know, why do they repeat purchase? You know, how can you if you've got maybe a 30% retention rate, then you know, how do you keep how do you get the rest? How do you get the 70% to also act in that way? Um, and then secondly is like how do you innovate past your core offering? Um, and you know, that's, that's what we see too, is like, okay, like we see a lot of brands that have a really strong start, but then they fizzle out because they don't innovate fast enough or bring out new product lines or, or categories that support that brand. Right. That, and, and that's, that's kind of the big kind of takeaway is like how important innovation is because, you know, if you were able to find something successful now, just imagine if you went and, you know, you, you dug deeper and you realigned and you took what you work, what worked for you. And then you introduced, uh, you know, more things that uh, were able to be uh, things that were, you know, better for the market uh, or just broader in appeal. Um, so I, I think, you know, what we miss and what, when we see brands that really get to the next level of like turning from a, you know, a maybe five to $10 million business to a 30 to a hundred million dollar business. Uh, it's, it's really on, it's on the innovation front uh, and it's on, you know, really seeing new product sets uh, that just keep, uh, you know, upping in terms of value. Uh, and, and that's, that's kind of key there. And that's only, that only can be done with research with talking and doing a lot of surveys with your current core customer, but also with the mark, what the market wants, um, and uh, is the thing that transforms a business from being like you know an on-trend thing that worked for a couple of years to a lifelong sustainable uh, you know you know business that that thrives and, and grows and becomes really successful. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. Um, awesome. We're going to finish it out with just one question quickly. Um, some actionable kind of tips and advice here. So what are some, some KPIs, some data indicators that merchants can look at to help identify, you know, their low hanging fruit opportunities, their growth opportunities right now? I know we've talked about it a lot internally, but what successful strategies have you guys seen just, you know, for identifying growth opportunities right now? Yeah, sure. Or right, go ahead, Moody. No, go ahead. Um, yeah, I guess like the, it's it's like how can we which like which one specifically from the paid ad standpoint? I mean, we're very much a CPA focused uh, agency. Like, if it's not getting an ROI, we're killing the campaign pretty quickly. Um, so one of the things that we look at internally on in terms of video content is we we call it the thumb stop rate. We look at how many people are actually stopping. Uh, so we basically created a ratio of like people who've you know, impressions uh, by by people who are, you know, making it to a second and a half or three seconds long. And that to us is a thumb stop rate. Um, and if you've got a thumb stop rate of at least 30% on your videos, you're doing really good. Uh, if it's lower than that, then, you know, whatever you're choosing as a thumbnail or your opening uh, video sequence is not, uh, is not stopping people and engaging them with your content. Um, so that for us is one on the front end. It's like a CTR for video for us. Um, that we look at, 
Uh, but beyond that, you know, for us, it's like we, we definitely look at return on ad spend, CPA, um, you know, and then the other thing is like there's a couple of key things that are really important. Um, it's it's scalability of, of content uh, and, uh, you know, it's like looking at liquidity of your media buy across placement, your audience, um, you know, uh, you know, what audiences you're choosing, uh, the creative you're, you're, you know, you're putting out there, make sure you have like all of the different, um, types of creative in, uh, both, you know, and mainly I'm talking to Facebook and Instagram here, uh, as key ones there, but, uh, those are all important things that need to be done that, uh, you know, uh, that, that I think a lot of people forget. Um, and you know, if your product, like there's always this, there's this thing that someone said a while ago that I really like, but it's like, how appealing is your product to a certain category of people versus like the general, let's say people you see at the DMV. Um, and the more broad it can potentially be like the more broad your appeal could be your, your offer or product could be appealing to the, to the bigger, you know, public, the more you're going to get in terms of scale. Uh, and, and, you know, that kind of goes against like, oh, build your product for small niche groups, but like also like, in terms of success, like going bigger and broader will allow you to, uh, really take on and build a big company if that's what you want to do. Yeah, definitely. Dan, Megan, you guys have anything to add on to that? Uh, um, so Moody alluded to it. I'll be real fast because I know we're running a little bit over. I, I would say real detailed look at the products that are performing compared to the customer profiles that you have on that customer to understand how consumers are engaging with d different types of consumers are behaving with different products. And I definitely hear my children in the background. Um, but like, I'll give you an example. I had a, I had a meeting with a coffee vendor, uh, a coffee a client, and you know, they have this massive uplift in at home, like product sales. They have physical locations too. Um, and so what's top of mind for them is saying all of these new customers that we've gone and acquired, you know, if their state really starts opening up and they go back to the office, how do I get them continuing to, to have home delivery of my product rather than just stopping on the way to the office or just drinking the office coffee? How do I keep them purchasing my product as their behavior may change over the next couple of months? So. My only my only advice would be be thinking about not just what's now but what's next in case consumer behavior does change and, and start to prepare for it. Yeah, that's a super good point. Yeah, no, I'm just gonna. Sorry. No, you're good. I was just gonna ask ask you had anything. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say I think like with customer segmentation, um, one thing I kind of noticed with a lot of my clients is. One metric that we have is uh, zero purchase customers. So those are people that have like come to the website, input their email, but haven't converted. And I've seen like a huge influx of that with a lot of my clients because I think more people are maybe surfing and you know researching before they buy. So, um, but I think that's like a low hanging fruit opportunity that clients can really take advantage of is like targeting that group because even if you convert ten percent of that, a lot of times there's a good bucket in there. Um, that's still a good number of new purchase customers. Um, but I think just kind of analyzing, like you guys have said too, like what channels are driving the most purchases, um, what are the most profitable, but then also looking at like product analysis now, because, um, you know, I work with the luxury brand that sells handbags and, you know, maybe their top products right now are like actually their shoes and their clutches, which are, which are at a lower price point. So, you know, doing the basket analysis, but really evaluating to like what products are doing the best on which channels um, and drilling down on all of that is all stuff that you can do now and, and continue to look at as well. Actually brings up a good point. Uh, so what we do is like we take a lot of that data and we create seed audiences for Facebook and uh, the other channels as well in terms of uh, one, you know, making sure that we're building like lookalikes off of uh, the correct, uh, you know, you know, type of segmentation versus from a product standpoint, but also like, uh, you know, an LTV, these are like kind of given. Um, but the other thing we could do is like kind of analyze uh, what, what's the, you know, 
standard consideration phase across the, the purchase journey or the journey to purchase. Uh, and then you can start to make remarketing campaigns that are tiered to either making that shorter or, you know, uh, being in time in tune with, with those specific phases, uh, which is, which is pretty cool stuff. And not, we, I mean, we audit a lot of accounts because we we're all, you know, we've, we're a big agency and a lot of agencies or a lot of other brands want to work with us. So something I constantly see is that there's not a lot of thought in remarketing sequences, both uh, at the category and product level, but also in terms of time and what, you know, sequence of messaging uh, you're, you're, you're actually putting together uh, for people in, in different phases of the funnel. Yeah. That's a super good point. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. That was like so illuminating. I could honestly like talk to you guys for hours. I know we've gone a little bit over our time, but it was really, really impactful. So thank you guys so much. Um, we've gone through all of our questions. I know we've gotten a couple of questions already, so I'll tackle those quick. Um, if anybody else has questions, um, you know, we'll hang in here for a couple of minutes. Um, if you have a question, if you want to know what Moody's TikTok handle is, which I would like to know, um, <laughs> maybe I'll tell us if you ask nicely. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, leave us your questions, and, and we've got we've got a couple, so I'll, I'll try to go through those now. I don't have a TikTok, by the way. My husband has one, so he shows me the funny ones. Um, but it is really like addictive. It's. I mean, mine isn't big at all, and it's not. It's definitely not digital marketing content. So if you want to make really <laughs> videos, it's moody by nature. Nice. To be my Instagram as well. Awesome. Um, but but yeah, uh, do we have any questions, did you say, or? Yeah, yeah, we've, we've got a couple in there right now. So, so Dan, I think this came up when you were talking about how um, most businesses are, are or should be looking to add a subscription option right now. So someone asked, how do you decide which products to offer as a subscription? subscription for brands that are considering doing that? Yeah, that's a great question. It's it's one that is hard to answer in a, in a webinar format um, without really getting granular about what their product mix looks like. Um, a couple of considerations. Is it uh, that I would just at a high level think about? Is it something that's consumable, right? Is it a fast moving consumer good? So if it's food and beverage, if it's Obviously, the razor blade example is the best, always like the one that's that's talked about. If it's something that's consumable that I need a new version of that or, or that I need to buy more of each and every month, that's the most obvious answer. Um, but sometimes the most obvious one isn't necessarily the smartest one to do too, right? So like we have a client now, and what they do is they sell um, bats. And they offer a membership subscription to bats, for, for kids' bats. So if you have a five-year-old that's just getting started in Little League, they grow a lot between five and seven. Rather than having to buy another bat every year or two, it's a subscription where I can send the bat back and get a new one that now fits the size of um, my children. So they both sell bats, but then offer a subscription model as well, right? So um, it, it's hard to answer without understanding the business around what products I would recommend. The easiest ones to recommend are the ones where Either it's something that's consumable, um, it's something that is highly changeable, like fast-paced fashion uh, as well, um, or seasonal. And uh, it might also be you know, something where um, you know, how a consumer uses it might, might change as well, um, like the bad example I gave. Um, I, 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 there's a lot more detail I can go into that to make this a much longer answer. Uh, if you want to contact me after this, please please feel free to. And, and there's a lot of a lot of, no, of nuance behind. Should you have a subscription model, and if so, what what should you offer? That's a really good point. Like you got so there's the Costco model. I mean, there's the obvious model, which is like the Dollar Shaves of the world, who are like right. you're gonna get something every month, and it's yeah. gonna be like to change out what's you know whatever. But then there's like the interesting. So like the Costco model is interesting because. Their subscription is like you get access to all this bulk merchandise or like Thrive Cosmetics does yeah. this too. Or yeah, there are a, lot of brands, a lot of brands trying that model now, right? It's I pay membership and then I get like the warehouse, the whole, the whole um, wholesale distribution price for the products for sure. Right. You know, or the Air One really model at this point too, <laughs> which is ridiculous. Don't even get me started on Air One. But uh, 
<laughs> but like it's you know it's there's a, there's a, dark, a lot of different ways to go about it that a lot of people don't think about uh and you know i mean it, there's a benefit to it especially if like subscription isn't your core business model um you know then it's something you can roll out and if you get 5 10 15 percent adoption i mean sometimes that that keeps the lights on or allows you to do some really interesting things uh for your business yeah i think subscriptions are awesome i know i'm one for fabletics and like i wouldn't buy that every month but because i am in a subscription then i either get charged and then i buy something or i have it um but one thing that we actually put in the app of blue for kleenex is like basically you can see on a product level you can see how many times somebody's purchased that particular product versus their lifetime orders and i think mm -hmm. that has helped our clients kind of identify. You can also see like the first purchase date, last purchase date, like the time in between that two. Um, so for people that are looking to maybe do subscriptions, they can kind of see like, okay, what is the behavior of our customers? Like, are they purchasing like 10 of this product and their overall lifetime is 10? So it's like they're purchasing that all the time. Um, so those are always helpful, helpful yeah. metrics. And, our, and, and even on that specifically, for those for whom that's an important part of their business model, we're seeing a lot of best practices or at least testing and learning. So like, you know, dropping new products for free into the next subscription um, as a test and learn or product expansion, which is what Moody described earlier around, you know, are you, are you diversifying enough? Um, and also we're seeing, you know, there are 30 million unemployed Americans right now and a lot of households are taking a hard look at their subscriptions. And so, you know, if it's core to your business model, you really need to think about what's going to get them not canceling mine. Yeah. Um, and so that could be, you know, an email about, you know, next month is on us. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because if I'm looking right now at my subscriptions and I know my next one's free, it's probably not the one I'm going to cut right now. Um, you know, there are different things that, that merchants are testing and learning in that regard as well. Yeah, that's a super good point. I think you know our, our subscription clients are some of our most interesting businesses just in terms of the, the products they sell, the data, there's so much you can do with it. Like mm -hmm. baseball bats is something I would never have thought of <laughs> as a subscription product, so I, I learned something new that's so interesting. I was just thinking the other day, I, I run and I was telling my husband, I really wish I could get a subscription to running shoes because you have to get new ones so frequently if you yeah. run a lot and like put a lot of miles on them. But I'm like, no one would want your old ones. You can't send them back. But someone who owns a running shoe business should think of that. Free idea. I love it. <laughs> um, we've got just just one last question here. I think this came up when we were talking about, I think maybe you were talking about, you know, different channels trending, you know, TikTok's really big right now. Um, someone was asking, are are how are you seeing trends for merchant selling on Amazon? I'm actually not sure if you guys do any Amazon sales or Amazon ads, but she was wondering if um, if merchants are moving away from selling on Amazon right now. Um, Amazon's interesting. Uh, we haven't seen people move away from it. If anything, people are gravitating towards it just because there's just so much volume there that you just can't ignore. Um, of course, there's pros and cons of whether or not to go on Amazon. I haven't seen people move away from it. Um, we do Amazon. We believe in it. There's a lot of really cool things that Amazon's coming out with to make their platform more robust. New, you know, they're making a lot. They're trying to make ads that mimic like discovery uh, on other channels as well. Um, you know, for us, th there's also the Amazon DSP where you can use and leverage Amazon data into. Uh, paid media channels, which is really cool, uh, like programmatic. Um, and then there's a couple of channels. I've been really excited about TikTok, but there's other channels that we're really exploring and finding traction on. Um, podcast is actually down, listen, li listenership's down because people aren't commuting. So, you know, that's a big thing. Like you said, the, the audio book on, on the commute and so is like listenership uh, is down as well. Um, and then uh, Connected TV, uh, Hulu is coming out with a pretty big DR platform soon, um, which is going to be big. Um, but yeah, there's there's a there's a lot of interesting channels uh, beyond you know our expertise of Facebook and Instagram. And uh, you know, if you just want to reach out to me, Moody at mute six dot com, we can talk about them uh, and see if they make sense for your business. Awesome. Yeah, and I'll I'll send out a link afterwards um, to the slides that has everybody's contact information, so you guys can definitely follow up with any other questions as well. I think um, just to add on to that from what I've seen is I don't see anybody kind of going away from Amazon because 
I mean, just kind of like the advertising channels, they kind of work in tandem. Um, there's a lot of benefits that you can get from Amazon, but I think that I there is an opportunity to really focus on that D to C, like look at your e-commerce data, invest in that, look in your Amazon data, invest in that too. So um, like I had one client yesterday, he's mainly just Amazon, but really wants to take this time to really build up his direct to consumer. And now's a good time to do that. So I think um, I haven't really seen anybody moving away from it, but I think that you can, you know, use this time to maximize growing that channel. And I've noticed that with a lot of big brands I work with too, um, that have a lot of times in the past been wholesale brands. So, um, you know, different products, whether that's toilet paper, bleach, things that you wouldn't necessarily buy directly in the past, there's this new opportunity for them to go directly to the consumer and kind of cut out the middleman. So, um, yeah. That's a really good point. It's interesting, right? Because you don't want to lose on the demand of Amazon as a brand, but you also want to establish the, the relationship uh, and own the customer on your own D2C channel if you can. So it's like, it's a, it's kind of like, like the way we see, we see a lot of brands do both uh, just because the demand on Amazon is just so great. Yeah. And it's easy, convenient. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up and let you guys go because we have gone way over our time, but this has been such an awesome conversation. I'm so grateful to, to you guys, to BigCommerce and Meet6 for joining us and for sharing these awesome insights. Um, and to everybody on the call, thank you guys so much. Um, I'm going to uh, get a recording um, set up. We'll send out a recording in a couple days. Um, we'll send out the slides as well. But if you guys have any last thoughts, um, any, anywhere that people can find you to, to look up Meet 6 to get in touch with Big Commerce, um, you know, let us know for sure. Love it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Thank you for listening. Thank you guys so much. Love Bye, you. And sorry for the technical difficulties, by the way, but we'll get those sorted out. Yeah, I apologize. I'm glad <laughs> I could talk. Yeah. Good. All right. Good. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.